So, um, in these next two chapters of René Ganon's book, uh, The Reign of Quantity and the Signs of the Times, these two chapters, I just want to focus on these two. Uh, the, uh, chapter 19, The Limits of History and Geography, and Chapter 20, From Sphere to Cube, because I think they can be uh, discussed uh, together. Um, in the one case, in the one chapter, he maintains this idea, which to me is a little strange, that um, we cannot know, there are two barriers uh, in our temporal knowledge. There's one at 600 BC, uh, the, beyond which we, we don't know very much about classical civilization, he says. Then there's another barrier at the beginning of the Kali Yuga in 3102 BC, he says, which is another barrier beyond which we cannot penetrate because everything is obscured to us uh, before 3102 BC, which is totally wrong. <laughs> it couldn't be more wrong. In fact, we know quite a bit about these epochs. We've got them mapped out very well uh, in quite a, a great bit of detail here. Um, so there's this, I want to hold in your mind this idea of the timeline for a second, and this other idea that he has about the relationship of the sphere to the cube. He says that the sphere precedes the cube in terms of these historical cycles. The sphere is the, the reign of quality, let's say, and the cube is the end point of history with the reign of quantity and its solidification process. The cube is the ultimate solid. If you set a cube on the ground, it's the most stable form there is. So it represents the total achievement of the omega point of history. Uh, the eschaton, let's say, the point at which everything moves into a total state of stasis, pure inertia. No more movement is possible. And so this is the difference in Christian eschatology between the world egg, the sphere of the Garden of Eden, and at the end of history, the New Jerusalem, which is indeed imagined as a sort of cube uh, or a box uh, in which the mineralogical uh, predominates. It's full of precious gems and minerals, whereas the Garden of Eden uh, is alive and dynamic. It's a garden. It's filled with vegetation and life and possibilities. The two trees, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of uh, the knowledge of immortality, that's all in there. So that's an interesting point about the New Jerusalem because the cathedrals, as Titus Burkhart writes in his book on Shard, uh, another esotericist, um, that sh the, all the cathedrals were imagined as uh, imitations or realizations in stone of the New Jerusalem. That's what they were pictured as. That's why they have the stained glass, because they're full of this idea of precious gems and minerals sparkling everywhere, uh, which is interesting because the cathedrals appear at the birth of Faustian history, not at its end. They appear at the birth, and they seem to represent a kind of uh, apprehension of the telos or goal, which is eventually for Faustian civilization to use science and the intellect to realize upon earth the new Jerusalem, which then becomes, uh, in my end is my beginning, as T.S. Eliot puts it in the four quartets, uh, in the beginning is also the end, uh, the goal, the telos, which is to realize the new Jerusalem and bring it down, like the mothership at the ending of Close Encounters of the Third Kind which is basically if, if you took a cathedral and you plugged it in and ran electricity through it, you get the mothership that comes down at the end of Close Encounters of the Third Kind as the New Jerusalem at the end of history. That's the omega point, the sphere. He also mentions, Ganon uh, mentions uh, Chinese cosmology is based on the interplay of the circle, Qian, uh, heavens, uh, is round. Uh, and they imagined uh, the heavens in their later cosmology as a kind of like a chariot with the... Uh, square part of the chariot representing the earth and the umbrella sticking up out of it representing the heavens, Chen and Di, uh, and the emperor is a sort of figure in between them who connects the two. Uh, so the earth is always imagined in Chinese cosmology as indeed a square. Uh, a square is another aspect of the cube, just as a circle is a slice of uh, the sphere. <laughs> so everything moves, and he says, if you imagine the wheel of history, even in the Hindu Manvantara, which is imagined as a wheel, if that wheel became a square, it couldn't roll. It would have to stop. And so, it, indeed, it represents the end goal, the point at which history uh, is over. And Ganon is simply announcing here the reign of quantity at the end of history. But what's interesting is this idea about these limitations of our knowledge in the previous chapter, not being able to go back much beyond the Kali Yuga. I want to take us back, way back beyond the Kali Yuga here for a minute, because it becomes interesting, this idea about the primordial preeminence of the circle over the square. Uh, this has an effect on Neolithic architecture, it, 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 and it becomes evident that the circular architecture does indeed precede rectangular architecture. 
and that's a bit of a mystery. We have to wonder why that is. Uh, if we look back at history, we've got uh, the lower Paleolithic going back 2.7 million years ago with the appearance of the first tool industries of Homo habilis, who was the first hominid to begin handling stone tools, the old Dowan uh, stone pebble tool chopper industry. And then all the way down from uh, 2.7 million years ago down to about 200,000 years ago, where the middle Paleolithic comes in from 200,000 years ago to 40,000 years ago. This is a period dominated by the Neanderthals with their culture and their technology um, in that period. And then with 40,000 BC, we've got uh, the appearance now of what John Pfeiffer used to call the creative explosion, which we have Cro-Magnon industries and art coming in now and overcoating the sign regime of the Neanderthals that were there in Europe for hundreds of thousands of years before the Cro-Magnon, also known as modern Homo sapiens, migrated across Palestine and into Europe and basically took it over. Their technologies were quite a bit superior, just as their art is superior to Neanderthal art. It was quite a feat of uh, ethnic cleansing and genocide that appears to have gone on here because Neanderthals are extinct by 27,000 BC. Uh, so they're there at 40,000 BC when the Cromanians get there, and they're gone by 27,000 BC. That cannot be an accident, nor was it. There was definite genocide going on. Um, but by this point, so we have the upper, <coughs> the other, the upper Paleolithic going <clears throat> all the way down from 40,000 BC to the Mesolithic, which comes in with the melting of the glaciers at about 14,000 years ago, right around 12,000 BC, something like that, the glaciers melt, and they melt catastrophically fast. Uh, James Hansen of NASA pointed out that the rise of the sea level seems to have been, with the melting of the glaciers during the end of the, the last ice age there, seems to have been about a meter every 20 years. So in a century, you've got a five meter or so sea level rise, and he says that all of this took place within about four centuries. So the melting of the ice, for whatever reason, was catastrophically fast, and maybe the flood myths come out of this. Uh, Ganon alludes to uh, the time of the biblical deluge in a vague way and the sinking of Atlantis. Um, who knows what he's talking about, but <clears throat> it is possible <clears throat> that myths <clears throat> of the deluge of the noetic flood myth, uh, which can be found all almost everywhere all over the world, it may refer back to floods that were going on at this time. Uh, and then the culture shifts to the Middle East from Europe, it shifts to the Middle East with the Natufians who come in now, uh, about 12,500 BC, they come in and they start building houses uh, at sites like Muraibet and especially at Abu Huraira. These are Neolithic village sites that represent the birth of the Neolithic. Uh, right along the uh, in Syria, on the along the upper Euphrates River there, uh, and they're located near gazelle migration routes. So the hunters are still thinking in Paleolithic terms of keeping the settlements tied to the animals. They're keeping a close eye on the gazelle migration routes that are going through this corridor here, where Abu Huraira and Mir Miraibet was. But these two sites seem to have been the earliest, at least in the West. China is a different matter, uh, where agriculture first appears. And so we have what uh, archaeologists call, and the great book for this, by the way, is Jacques Covin's uh, book, The uh, Birth of the Gods and um, Agriculture, or The Birth of uh, the Gods Out of Agriculture in the Near East. Um, it's a great book, and he goes through and he analyzes the structure here. This is all pre-Kali Yuga, by the way, of the Neolithic as the pre-pottery Neolithic A, uh, which comes in here at about 10,000 BC and goes down to about 8,600 BC and the pre-pottery Neolithic B, which goes from 8600 BC to about 7000 BC, after which we get the pottery Neolithic proper. Each one of these three epochs has its own internal, structurally consistent morphological characteristics, so they divide very well. And with the pre-pottery Neolithic A, we get the predominance of, indeed, at Miraibet, lower levels of Miraibet and Abu Huraira, and another site called Jir Falamar, uh, circular architecture. Uh, the, the houses are built, uh, in egg-shaped circles that are actually sunk down uh, a couple of feet into the ground, and over time the houses will rise and then become rectangular, uh, as they do in the pre-pottery Neolithic B, uh, 8,600 to 7,000, uh, the architecture Coban says is rectangular. So we get the rise of rectangular architecture, and morphologically some of the other characteristics of the PPNA are um, we get the rise of goddess figurines, the discovery of agriculture, plant uh, domestication goes on in the PPNA, 
which seems to have been something that was probably figured out by women who were out hunting and uh, gathering uh, fruits and nuts and herbs and so forth while the men were out hunting gazelle. And so uh, it's possible that the women may have figured this out, the relationship of the seed to the soil at this time. But in the PPNB, we begin to get a not only rectangular architecture, but also animal domestication, although the dog had probably been around since way back. Uh, but animal domestication proper uh, begins to come in during the PPNB. So we get animal domestication. And um, we also get during the PPNB the appearance of male figurines alongside of female figurines from the earlier epoch. And the burial of the dead in the PPNB, uh, the dead are normally buried under the, under the floors of the houses. So there's a very cozy relationship between uh, the cult of the dead and the people living in their houses. In the pottery Neolithic by 7000 BC, uh, they start leaving the dead out. They bury them in se separate uh, ne necropolises elsewhere. And the architecture in the pottery Neolithic from seven from about uh, pottery Neolithic is about 6,800 or 7,000 something like that to down to 5,200 BC, whereupon the Calcolithic or the Copper Age comes in. But during the pottery Neolithic, we get the efflorescence of pottery proper, uh, the Great Samaran uh, and Halafian styles of pottery, which were rivals uh, in the uh, region of the Tigris and Euphrates zone. These are the pre-Sumerians. Samarans. Uh, they're down there on the plain in the dry farming zone inventing irrigation while the Halafians are located in the mountainous regions uh, of the Taurus range to the north uh, and they still have circular architecture. The Halafians were kind of archaeists. Um, they're out there 5000 BC or so, 5000, 6000, making the world's finest um, ceramics uh, and at this time we get uh, what Mary Setegast calls pyrotechnologies which is the cremation of the dead now comes in at during the pottery neolithic we have the cremation of the dead and we have also uh the first metallurgy uh copper trinkets are being made kilns are coming in two chambered kilns for the making of pottery so we've got fire the mastery of fire takes place now during the pottery neolithic and we've got these pyrotechnologies and a new cult of the dead burning of the dead rectangular architecture seems to coexist with uh, circular architecture because what the Mycenaeans later inherit as the Tholos tombs, which they got from the Cretans, the Tholos tombs of the Mycenaeans appear uh, right about 1600 BC. They got them from the, Cretan, uh, the Cretans, where domed architecture appears 3000 BC on Crete. And Crete seems to have got it possibly from Cyprus, where at the site of Chirochidia, 7000 BC, the houses are egg-shaped. They're, they're all sort of domical egg shapes uh, on Cyprus. And we can track the Halafians, too, going inland along the, the Taurus Range Mountains. The Halafian sites proper all seem to have Tholos-style uh, architecture, whereas the Samarans do not. The Samarans are down on the plain between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, and they're inventing new kinds of uh, villages that are beginning to complexify into cities. At Baucris, they're separating the houses <clears throat> and putting in streets from the first time. At El Kalm and the El Kalm Oasis, uh, they're discovering irrigation. This is all around 6800 BC. They're discovering irrigation. They're laying the foundations now for what is going to be uh, the civilizational event 3500 BC with the birth of the first cities in Ur and Uruk and uh, Eridu in the south of uh, Mesopotamia. And we get civilization proper coming in, which is the date that Rene Ganon gives for the Kali Yuga 3102 BC coming in right there. Uh, I don't see this as a Kali Yuga. I, I see this as a, this is a gradual triumph here of the human species and ascent over nature and a mastery over nature. But we do notice this idea that he points out that the circle always does seem to precede the cube in the sense that uh, architecture, the older architecture always does seem to be circular at first because it's uteromorphic, it's womb-shaped, uh, what Peter Sloterdijk would call in his Spheres trilogy, uteromorphic architecture. It's, it's comforting, it's round, uh, but it's difficult to add additional rooms to circular architecture, and so that may have been the reason, perhaps, why in the PPNB, uh, the circular architecture of sites like Mir Ibed and Abu Huraira shifted during the PPNB to rectangular architecture, which is more modular. You can sort of build units and agglomerate them on top of each other, as at the site of Chattel Hoyek, 6800 BC, uh, where the whole thing looks like a pueblo. And you have the, the rise and victory there, purely rectangular architecture. But I think it also indicates that the intellect comes in now. 
more so. The, the masculine element of the intellect comes in in the PPNB, uh, whereas the PPNA is sort of goddess dominant. You've got all the goddess figurines. The women are figuring out uh, agriculture, figuring out the sort of technology of plants. But the men are out carrying the hunting technologies with them and their dogs probably, and they were the ones who figured out how to domesticate the animals, how to wrestle them into submission, corral them, and genetically select the ones uh, who are dangerous, the, the horns and the hooves, uh, getting rid of all of those kinds of dangerous characteristics and having the human intellect, intellect interfere actually in the genetic flow. So you've got more intellect coming in at the same time that you have this rectangular architecture coming in. The, the mind always is laid on the scene. The mind is rectangular. It's later. It's a later addition. It's something that always comes after the womb or the processes of the circularity of nature. Nature is composed of circular processes that are inherently morphogenetic. They don't need the, intellect, the human intellect. Uh, they just create, 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 and it's all circles everywhere you look. The planets are moving in circles. That's why we have astrology. All of this stuff is going in terms of circular motion. By the time the, the human intellect gets on the scene with its ability to introduce right angularity into all of this, for the first time in evolutionary history, something new comes along with the human masculine male intellect, which is able to think in 90 degree right angles. And that now appears and gets inserted in history, starting in the PPNB, which we noted was 8600 to 7000 BC. Here comes all the rectangular architecture. The intellect is coming in and civilization is getting going. It becomes more and more rectangular and rectilinear over time, and uh, the rotundity of the spherical shapes become associated with the cults of the Great Mother. Um, I like how in Kubrick's film 2001 A Space Odyssey, he inverts this, and he puts the rectangular shape of the monolith at the birth of a human history, uh, because it's the human being who introduces into nature an element that was alien to it and never present there before, right-angled thinking that enables the, basically the basis for him to then produce technology. And so it becomes this arachnus event with the monolith and uh, the birth of technology amongst these Australopithecines. <clears throat> and then we've got the circle associated with HAL 9000, who has the eye, uh, the circle, um, which is sort of at the end of the process, HAL goes crazy he runs, takes a left turn and goes off into circular thinking, let's say. But at uh, the end of history, the eschaton in that film is the Stargate, which is provided by the rectangular monolith at the end of history, like the New Jerusalem. And uh, Dave Bowman goes through the Stargate, and we get the symbolic end of man, the death of man, with uh, the death of Dave Bowman on the bed at the end there, as symbolic of the entire human species being transformed into something else, something supra-rational, something uh, supra-hominid. Uh, of some sort that is, we don't know what it's going to be. We see the fetus, uh, again, at the end of history now, instead of the monolith, we've got the, the fetus with the glowing star child at the end. So we've got the monolith at the beginning and the round fetus at the end. So he sort of inverts it, uh, but he understands the symbolism pretty clearly uh, because the round uh, spherical shape represents the birth of a new historical cycle, which we see coming at the end of that film. So. Uh, that's my riff on these two chapters uh, by Rene Ganon.